Please join us for our opening prayer. Father God, we are blessed to be able to join together in worship, lifting our praise to you. We earnestly desire to know you more and to have the same mind as your son, Jesus. We long to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Through your Holy Spirit, help us to live in close fellowship with you so that we may be your city on a hill. Shine through us today and always so we may reflect your glory and love in all that we say and do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Emmy Markham, and we want to welcome you into worship with us. Whether you're here in person or watching online, we are so glad that you have chosen to be in worship with us today. Hopefully you saw the announcements scrolling through on our screen or on yours before the service began. If you miss them, they can be found on our Facebook page. That is an excellent source of information about the life of our church, so please visit often. I have a few brief announcements for you this morning. <clears throat> First, the season of Lent is just a few weeks away, and we will enter into that sacred time of year with an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, February 22nd at 6.30. The following Saturday, February 25th, we will have an interactive prayer station set up in the sanctuary from 11 to 2. We hope you'll mark your calendars for those special events, invite your friends, and come join us for them. Next, the discernment team will be having an all-church informational meeting on Sunday, February 19th, immediately following our morning worship at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Please mark your calendar and plan on attending that important meeting. Finally, I want to invite Matt Dietrich, our D Director of Youth Ministries, to come up front for a couple of announcements about our youth group. Well, good morning. good morning. I wanted to tell you about a couple of events that the youth group has coming up. The first is that next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday, February 12th. So we will be having a youth group Super Bowl party. It will be from 6 until 9.30 at the McGimsey Schmidt House. So if you are in grades 6 through 12, we would love for you to come and bring your friends. The one thing that you need to bring with you to come to the Super Bowl, par Super Bowl party is some sort of Super Bowl food to share with the rest of the group. The other thing I wanted to let you all know about is our youth group's 30-hour famine. The 30-hour famine is an event sponsored by the Christian nonprofit organization World Vision, and we do this every year for two very important reasons. First, we do it so that we can know what hunger truly feels like. So we'll be going 30 hours without eating so that we can know what so many people across the globe go through on a daily basis. But we also do the 30-hour famine so that we can raise money to fight back against global hunger. Our 30-hour famine is Friday, February 24th through Saturday, February 25th. And we want to invite you to partner with us in the 30-hour famine. And there are two ways that you can do that. First, you can do that through prayer. We hope that you will be praying for us leading up to the famine and then especially during those 30 hours where we're not eating. But we also want to invite you to partner with us by sponsoring us financially. The suggested donation for the 30-hour famine is $40. And with that $40, World Vision can feed a hungry child for a month, but also get them access to clean water and health care and education. So that $40 goes a long way. Uh, if you can't do $40, that's all right. We'll take any amount that you can give. It will all go to helping hungry children. You can see one of our youth if you would like to sponsor them individually, um, and hopefully they will come and talk to you about that. If not, we are collecting money until Sunday, March the 12th. If no youth has come to you by then, you can drop a check in the offering plate. Make sure that you make that out to World Vision and write 30-hour famine in the memo line. I just want to thank you all for your generous support of us in years past while we've done this. And thank you in advance for supporting us this year as well. Thank you, Matt. And now will you please join me for our call to worship. Happy are those who worship the Lord and delight in God's precepts. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. They will never be moved. Let this be our 
we have the opportunity uh, to sing two of the great hymns of the faith. The first one puts me in the mind of my favorite verse in the Bible, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It acknowledges the holiness of God and helps us to feel our need for it. And the second one rejoices in the grace God has given us, even the assurance of our salvation. So if you haven't guessed what they are, let's stand and sing them with all our hearts as Jim Parrish plays for us. Blessed assurance. You, now you know what song we're singing. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Her 
perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. Thank you, Jim, for playing for us today, and thank you, choir, for leading us in worship this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the grace that you have for us that goes before us, that uh, surrounds us and fills us and prepares our way going ahead of us. Lord, um, we, we love you so much, and we're so grateful to be here today in your presence. We thank you for all that you've done for us in the past weeks, and we pray that you would open our eyes and help us to be even more aware of all the ways that you're moving and working in our lives. Lord, we confess there have been times when, instead of following you, we've chosen our own way. Lord, we're still sinners and still in need of your grace. We give you thanks that long before we did anything, you sent your son Jesus into this world to teach and to heal and to serve, to show us the way and, and to become the way himself as he laid his life down on that cross at Calvary. We thank you that your love didn't stop there. It didn't stay in the tomb, but three days later, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you raised Jesus from the dead. And that right now, he's at your right-hand side, interceding still on behalf of us, praying prayers that we don't know how to pray ourselves. And so we're, we come encouraged today to come to your throne room and lay at your feet the burdens that our hearts bear for our friends and our family and those whose lives touch our own. And we lift them up to you, Lord, asking for healing for those who are sick and hurt, asking for peace for those who are in conflict and turmoil, asking for provision for those who are going without, Lord, asking for uh, for your help, for your salvation, for those who are still lost and dead in their sins. Lord, we pray for those um, who need your wisdom and guidance. Our leaders, ourselves, as we lead in our, our families, in our businesses, in our community. Lord, we pray for your wisdom and guidance today. Lord, we thank you that you don't leave us in the brokenness that we find ourselves, but you send your spirit to pick us up and put us back on that path you've always meant for us to walk. And so we pray for that today, as we come today as your children, praying the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward this morning, I want to uh, remind you that today is uh, our benevolence offering, and if you'd like to give to our benevolence for fund, there is a plate back there between the pews and the chairs. We invite you to uh, put your offering in. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the way that you do provide for us. And uh, Lord, in, in these moments, we pray that you would give us a cheerful heart to give back just a portion of that which you've already given us, that you would break our offerings and bless them and use them to feed the multitude in your kingdom. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Stand if you are able and join me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for today's scripture reading. Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much, much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature who do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor or ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even in the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? 
So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Emmy. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the way that it shapes and transforms us. We thank you for your spirit that so inspired this word and faithfully carried it to us today and is here among us even now. Lord, we pray by the power of your spirit that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might receive you and receive you well. In Jesus' name, amen. It's humbling to realize just how old you are and how little do you know for all of your years, isn't it? I've had the privilege of watching children grow up from a distance, kind of like being a grandparent without having to go through the parenthood part. And Becca has always done a better job of keeping up with them than I have. She's always understood their culture better than me. And uh, truthfully, I had difficulty keeping up with the popular culture of youth when I was a young teenager myself. I remember being frustrated that my parents could not understand my culture than we were, uh, when we were younger. And I also remember hearing stories from my grandparents and some of the older generation that told us our parents were just like us when they were younger too. However, today's young people are different from the generations that have gone before them. They have some extraordinary gifts for language that I'm not sure our world has ever seen. The youth of our world have been raised with a mobile communication in a way that has given them the ability to connect with people all across the world through text and through symbols. And these words and symbols are only sometimes in English. Sometimes they're abbreviations of other words. Other times they're made up words altogether. And often they're not even meant to be read out loud, which is baffling to me. It's a visual communication that crosses national and cultural boundaries, and I understand very little of it. Within 10 years, I will need help understanding American English used by everyone else around me. Everyone younger than me will be able to understand me well enough. They'll understand me, but I will be left in the dark when they speak and text their lingo to and around me. And that will be a challenge to me, but that will be a gift to the world. When Greece and Rome took over Europe and parts of Asia and Africa, they brought their language with them. And that language carried the gospel and built the church across the world for a thousand years. And for the next 500 years after that, we've been working on translating the gospel out to as many different people as we can. And so as a result, our children can take the gospel further and faster, going right through and behind enemy lines in ways that we cannot even imagine sitting here today. Reaching people won't be the issue for them. Our challenge is is ensuring that we find the way to teach the gospel to them so that they know what to share with the world. Now, sharing Jesus with others does not sound difficult at first, but when we get down to the figuring out the words and how to back up those words with our actions, it can quickly become like a mission impossible, and all the wisdom in the world will fail us in that mission. However, in Christ, we find wisdom 
that's greater than the world's wisdom. It's tempting to overcomplicate anything spiritual in our lives. The meaning of the word spiritual has changed a lot over the years. In past centuries, it referred to a religious process of reformation that sought to uh, recover the original state of humanity, which is the image of God. Going back to the Garden of Eden, going back to Adam and Eve before sin entered the world. That's what spirituality originally meant. But over the centuries, a second meaning has worked into that concept of being spiritual. Today, the word spiritual usually means subjective, as in to each their own. When we say things are simple but cannot communicate how to do them, things get muddy and overcomplicated. And what starts as just getting from point A to point B becomes a maze. And Paul calls the gospel message a mystery. And mysteries are, by nature, like mazes. They're complex. Mysteries and mazes have wrong turns, false leads, and they sometimes have a variety of possible endings. Some mysteries have confounded humanity since the beginning of time, and they can be incredibly complicated. However, once you know the solution, the maze becomes very simple. But you cannot help someone else through a maze that you've not already gone through. But once you have the answer, everything becomes simple. That mystery of God is as simple as restoring us to our original purpose, to the humanity we lost when sin entered the world. Before Jesus, it was impossible. After Jesus, it becomes simple for us to experience. Jesus comes to us at point A and leads us to point B. We no longer have to navigate the maze. The path from death to life is simple. Follow Jesus. Now, Paul knew it was simple to say that Jesus leads us from death to life. And once we've experienced that saving grace and that transformation, we can share each step that we take as we follow Jesus into that new life. And many of these steps are things that others can do also. Read the Bible, attend a worship service, pray, find ways to serve others. These are things that people do as they follow Jesus. But doing those things will not automatically get you through the maze without him. Navigating a maze may involve a lot of left turns and right turns, but if you don't make them in the right places at the right time, you will still be lost. Now, the mystery of our spiritual life is simple, but it's not easy. Telling to someone to follow Jesus is simple. Following Jesus yourself and leading by example takes work. Jesus promised in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, he said, there are blessings and challenges both on the road that he leads us. Now, some of those challenges can be impossible on our own, like trying to build a ship in a bottle by just tossing in the pieces, squirting in some glue, and shaking it around until the ship comes out of that. I've noticed that worldly wisdom does not run very deep. And once we found the bottom line, we get suggestions that sound like instructions we get from our customer service, from our tech devices. Have you tried turning the power off and back on again? You need to load, download the, the latest information for it. Or for some of our more antique machines, just give it a good kick to get it going. That worldly wisdom may solve some tech and mechanical issues, but it won't work for your life or for those that you love. Likewise, the worldly wisdom will not work for spiritual problems. There are many books and opinions about handling spiritual issues in your life, and all of them come down to two directions and one destination. The first direction is to just think positively and try your hardest to achieve your desires. And the second direction is to just give up your desires because the hard truth is we don't get everything that we want. But the final destination, it doesn't matter which direction you choose, the final destination for that is the realization that we don't have control over our lives. We only have the choice of how we respond to life as it comes to us. Worldly wisdom will eventually 
tell you that life is too complicated and that nothing you do matters in the long run. So just do whatever is easiest. It won't make a difference in the end. All the wisdom in the world will bring you to that point. And brothers and sisters, that is a lie. We do not have control over many things, but every choice that we make matters. The Bible that we have is a different kind of book. It tells us that, yes, we are not in control of our lives, but that God is in control and that God loves us. Paul wrote that a God who sent his only son into the world only to be crucified sounds foolish. More than that, it sounds like utter madness, but our world cannot think spiritually, so they miss a vital piece of that message. They ignore the fact that Jesus came willingly, and he had opportunities to make different choices every day of his life. He was born a king. The angels were proclaiming it. And at his death, there was a sign above his head that said, King of the Jews. He was born a king. And he died a king as well. But the life he lived was the life of a servant. He chose not to claim his royal privileges in our world. And he did that because he had the spiritual wisdom to know that what comes after is far greater than anything that comes before. Therefore, as followers of Jesus, we do not look back to the good old days behind us. Instead, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who goes before us, leading us closer to God. Our past is essential, and it stands as a witness of God's love for us. And we need to understand that who we are as God's people, our history stands on Scripture. And if we deny or neglect that Scripture, we're building a history for ourselves that doesn't have a foundation, and it's going to collapse on top of all of us. God's Holy Spirit works in cooperation with the Scriptures to connect us to Jesus, who is the living Word of God. Now, as Paul wrote, we have limited minds compared to the wisdom of God. So much of life, especially spiritual things, are mysteries to us that we have no hope of solving on our own. But if you follow Jesus and you have a relationship with him, he will share his wisdom with you. Through Jesus, you have access to the mind of Christ, but you only have it through him. As Jesus taught in John chapter 15, he is the vine and we are the branches. We are created to bear fruit for him, but we can do nothing if we are not connected to him. We can access the wisdom of God as scripture and the Holy Spirit point us to Jesus in a way that we can follow and obey, even if following and obeying it goes beyond our understanding at that moment. But without scripture and the Holy Spirit both, we wouldn't know Jesus. We would be without spiritual wisdom and we will have nothing to share with future generations. Brothers and sisters, will you seek the wisdom of God today? Will you ask for his help in the decisions and opportunities that are before you today? As we celebrate Holy Communion, in just a moment, we're making a covenant with God. We admit our sins and our weaknesses. We recognize our need for God. And we ask God to give us the wisdom and the grace that we need to be his church. So I invite you to join me today as we seek God together. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who seek to live in peace with one another, Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience.
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim that mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes back in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ given for you. We're going to sing a song here at the end that encapsulates much of what uh, Tony preached today. I had the privilege of attending Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and just as And Can It Be is sort of the theme song over at Asbury, our theme song was this hymn. You may not know it, but 
you'll have six short verses to learn it. May the mind of Christ my Savior. Would you stand? Sunday school starts in just a moment, and we invite you to come back this evening for our evening service at 6. Brother Richard's going to be uh, sharing with us. But I invite you now to go now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, knowing that He goes before you and is going to reach that step even before you do, has grace to carry you through that. And your part in all of this is to respond to His grace and share it with those who cross your path. Lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 